Hello, my name is Trace. I'm from the state of Kansas within the United States. I would like to introduce to you this channel consisting of English with a subtitle. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, 1898-1963 Peter's First Battle while the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away the beavers and the children were walking on hour after hour into what seemed a delicious dream. Long ago they had left the coats behind them. And by now they had even stopped saying to one another, Look, there's a kingfisher, or I say bluebells, or what was that lovely smell, or just listen to that thrush. They walked on in silence, drinking it all in, passing through patches of warm sunlight into cool green thickets and out again into wide mossy glades where tall elms raised the leafy roof far overhead, and then into dense masses of flowering currant and among hawthorn bushes where the sweet smell was almost overpowering. They had been just as surprised as Edmund when they saw the winter vanishing, and the whole wood passing in a few hours or so from January to May. They hadn't even known for certain, as the witch did, that this was what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spells which had produced the endless winter, and therefore they all knew when this magic spring began that something had gone wrong, and badly wrong, with the witch's schemes. And after the thaw had been going on for some time, they all realized that the witch would no longer be able to use her sledge. After that, they didn't hurry so much, and they allowed themselves more rests and longer ones. They were pretty tired by now, of course, but not what I'd call bitterly tired, only slow and feeling very dreamy and quiet inside, as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister on one heel. They had left the course of the big river some time ago, for one had to turn a little bit to the right, that meant a little to the south, to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been their way, they couldn't have kept to the river valley once the thaw began, for with all that melting snow the river was soon in flood, a wonderful roaring, thundering yellow flood, and their path would have been under water. And now the sun got low, and the light got redder, and the shadows got longer, and the flowers began to think about closing. Not long now, said Mr. Beaver, and began leading them uphill across some very deep, springy moss. It felt nice under their tired feet, in a place where only tall trees grew very wide apart. The climb coming at the end of the long day made them all pant and blow, and just as Lucy was wondering whether she could really get to the top without another long rest, suddenly they were at the top. And this is what they saw. They were on a green, open space, from which they could look down on the forest, spreading as far as one could see in every direction, except right ahead. There, far to the east, was something twinkling and moving. By gum, whispered Peter to Susan, the sea. In the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great, grim slab of grey stone supported on four upright stones. It looked very old, and it was cut all over with strange lines and figures that might be the letters of an unknown language. They gave you a curious feeling when you looked at them. The next thing they saw was a pavilion pitched on one side of the open place. A wonderful pavilion it was, and especially now when the light of the setting sun fell upon it, with sides of what looked like yellow silk and cords of crimson and tent pegs of ivory. 
and high above it, on a pole, a banner which bore a red, rampant lion fluttered in the breeze, which was blowing in their faces from the far-off sea. While they were looking at this, they heard a sound of music on their right, and turning in that direction, they saw what they had come to see. Aslan stood in the center of a crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves round him in the shape of a half-moon. There were tree women there, and well women, dryads and naiads, as they used to be called in our world, who had stringed instruments. It was they who had made the music. There were four great centaurs. The horse part of them was like huge English farm horses, and the man part was like stern but beautiful giants. There was also a unicorn and a bull with the head of a man, and a pelican and an eagle and a great dog. And next to Aslan stood two leopards, of whom one carried his crown and the other his standard. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children didn't know what to do or say when they saw him. People who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of it now. For when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes, and then they found they couldn't look at him and went all trembly. Go on whispered Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter, you first. No, sons of Adam before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver, back again. Susan, whispered Peter, what about you, ladies first? No, you're the eldest, whispered Susan. And, of course, the longer they went on doing this, the more awkward they felt. Then, at last, Peter realized that it was up to him. He drew his sword and raised it to the salute, and hastily said to the others, Come on, pull yourselves together. He advanced to the lion and said, We have come, Aslan. Welcome, Peter, son of Adam, said Aslan. Welcome, Susan and Lucy, daughters of Eve. Welcome, he beaver and she beaver. His voice was deep and rich, and somehow took the fidgets out of them. They now felt glad and quiet, and it didn't seem awkward to them to stand and say nothing. But where is the fourth? asked Aslan. He has tried to betray them and join the white witch, O oh Aslan, said Mr. Beaver, and then something made Peter say, That was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him, and I think that helped him to go wrong. And Aslan said nothing, either to excuse Peter or to blame him, but merely stood looking at him with his great unchanging eyes, and it seemed to all of them that there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan, but it may be harder than you think. And then he was silent again for some time. Up to that moment, Lucy had been thinking how royal and strong and peaceful his face looked. Now, it suddenly came into her head that he looked sad as well. But next minute, that expression was quite gone. The lion shook his mane and clapped his paws together. Terrible paws, thought Lucy, if he didn't know how to velvet them, and said, Meanwhile, let the feast be prepared. Ladies, take these daughters of Eve to the pavilion and minister to them. When the girls had gone, Aslan laid his paw, and though it was velveted, it was very heavy, on Peter's shoulder and said, Come, son of Adam, and I will show you a far-off sight of the castle where you are to be king. And Peter, with his sword still drawn in his hand, went with the lion to the eastern edge of the hilltop. There a beautiful sight met their eyes. The sun was setting behind their backs. That meant that the whole country below them lay in the evening light, forest and hills and valleys, and winding away like a silver snake the lower part of the great river. And beyond all this, miles away, was the sea, and beyond the sea the sky, full of clouds, which were just turning rose color with the reflection of the sunset. But just where the land of Narnia met the sea, in fact at the mouth of the great river, 
there was something on a little hill shining. It was shining because it was a castle, and of course the sunlight was reflected from all the windows which looked towards Peter and the sunset. But to Peter it looked like a great star resting on the seashore. That, O oh man, said Aslan, is Ker Paravel of the four thrones, in one of which you must sit as king. I show it to you because you are the firstborn, and you will be high king over all the rest. And once more Peter said nothing, for at that moment a strange noise broke the silence suddenly. It was like a bugle, but richer. It is your sister's horn, said Aslan to Peter in a low voice, so low as to be almost a purr, if it is not disrespectful to think of a lion purring. For a moment Peter did not understand. Then, when he saw all the other creatures start forward and heard Aslan say with a wave of his paw, Back, let the prince win his spurs, he did understand and set off running as hard as he could to the pavilion. And there he saw a dreadful sight. The naiads and dryads were scattering in every direction. Lucy was running towards him as fast as her short legs would carry her, and her face was as white as paper. Then he saw Susan make a dash for a tree, and swing herself up, followed by a huge grey beast. At first Peter thought it was a bear, then he saw that it looked like an Alsatian, though it was far too big to be a dog. Then he realized that it was a wolf, a wolf standing on its hind legs, with its front paws against the tree trunk, snapping and snarling. All the hair on its back stood up on end. Susan had not been able to get higher than the second branch. One of her legs hung down so that her foot was only an inch or two above the snapping teeth. Peter wondered why she did not get higher, or at least take a better grip. Then he realized that she was just going to faint, and that if she fainted, she would fall off. Peter did not feel very brave. Indeed, he felt he was going to be sick. But that made no difference to what he had to do. He rushed straight up to the monster and aimed a slash of his sword at its side. That stroke never reached the wolf. Quick as lightning, it turned round its eyes flaming and its mouth wide open in a howl of anger. If it had not been so angry that it simply had to howl, it would have got him by the throat at once. As it was, though all this happened too quickly for Peter to think at all, he had just time to duck down and plunge his sword as hard as he could between the brute's forelegs into its heart. Then came a horrible, confused moment, like something in a nightmare. He was tugging and pulling, and the wolf seemed neither alive nor dead, and its bared teeth knocked against his forehead, and everything was blood and heat and hair. A moment later, he found that the monster lay dead, and he had drawn his sword out of it, and was straightening his back and rubbing the sweat off his face and out of his eyes. He felt tired all over. Then, after a bit, Susan came down the tree. She and Peter felt pretty shaky when they met, and I won't say there wasn't kissing and crying on both sides. But in Narnia, no one thinks any the worse of you for that. Quick, quick, shouted the voice of Aslan. Centaurs, eagles, I see another wolf in the thickets. There, behind you. He has just darted away. After him, all of you. He will be going to his mistress. Now is your chance to find the witch and rescue the fourth son of Adam. And instantly, with a thunder of hoofs and beating of wings, a dozen or so of the swiftest creatures disappeared into the gathering darkness. Peter, still out of breath, turned and saw Aslan close at hand. You have forgotten to clean your sword, said Aslan. It was true. Peter blushed when he looked at the bright blade and saw it all smeared with the wolf's hair and blood. He stooped down and wiped it quite clean on the grass, then wiped it quite dry on his coat. Hand it to me and kneel, son of Adam, said Aslan. 
And when Peter had done so, he struck him with the flat of the blade and said, Rise up, Sir Peter Wolf's Bane, and whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword.